Okay, so let us start tonight. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Joint Singapore and Hong Kong Center webinar, Future of Red Tech Impact. Hello, can you hear us now? Uh, it's, uh, yes, Phoenix, yeah, you're right. back. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Sorry for my internet not stable because of the type. Um, we have members of different professional institutions from many regions, including Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan, Malaysia, Korea, and so on. Done. We will have a keynote speech on Big Trend in Red Hat 2022. Then we will have the panel discussion on AI implementation in Red Hat. After the panel discussion, we will have the Q&A part. So if you have any questions during the time, please feel free to use the Q&A function in the bottom of your Zoom screen. For MSC in We are honored that you have four season speakers. They are Mr. Andrew Gover, Dr. Amanda Lim, Mr. Daryl Pereira, and Mr. Chai Kit Jong. On the top left of our screen, we have Andrew, who is the Chief Examiner Asia and Director of Compliance Education APAC Academy, also known as ICA, with solid experience in finance industry, especially in compliance. Andrew designed and delivered new programs mapped to the local educational and regulatory stand in Australia, Hong He is also a visiting fellow and mentor for the university. Amanda, director at ACH Worldwide, as an experienced consultant and project research lecturer, Amanda published more than 30 articles and research reports related to digital economy, AI, and fintech. Besides, she is also a project supervisor of the AMBS Global MBA program, and of course, herself is also an alumni of the Manchester Global MBA. Cyber at KPMG Singapore. Daryl leading his team at KPMG to provide advisory service to the client on cyber strategies and governance, IT risk management, cyber crisis management, and other cyber security related. Daryl, Manchester Global MBA program too. Last but not least, we have Chai Kit, CEO and co-founder of Synosis Solutions. Under his leadership, Synosis Solutions is recognized one of the top 10 fintech leaders at the Singapore Fintech Award in 2019. So we are very grateful for all our Enoch's speech, please. Okay, um, thank you, Phoenix. That was, unfortunately, was a little bit broken. Uh, I understand you're having a, some significant weather um, over there at the moment. So I hope people manage to uh, follow what was being said. I will now begin my part. Hopefully you're, you can see my screen. Check it if you give me a thumbs up, if you can see my screen. Grand. Thank you very much. So hello, it's uh, a privilege to be invited to talk to you all today, this morning, this evening, this afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, and a little bit later to host a conversation with our three esteemed panelists. When we were putting this session together, we looked at it. The title of the session is The Future of RegTech. But I became acutely aware that there, not all of the people that are tuned in to listen to us today have been living with RegTech and FinTech since they first crashed into widespread parlance in the financial services industry 
and that a lot of people may still be unclear as to what we mean when we use these terms. So I thought it would be appropriate to actually start this session, which is going to be looking forward, by actually looking backward a little bit. Let's take a, a short trip and look at the road that we've already travelled in the RegTech FinTech world and have a look at some of the bumps that we've encountered along the way and hopefully um, we've managed to learn from. And another thing that struck me is the financial services industry is well known for having created a language of its own. If you listen to two compliance professionals particularly talking to each other, it's pretty hard to follow what they're saying unless you're mired in the, in the jargon. Um, often it's acronyms or it's abbreviations. And so you hear two people talking about AML CFT, which is fine, except in certain parts of the world, they don't call it CFT, they call it CTF. So one is countering the financing of terrorism, and the other is countering terrorism financing, both meaning the same thing, but slightly different order. And then we add to that PF and EDD and SDD and KYC and CDD, and so it goes on and on and on. And one of the problems with jargon is that uh, there's very clear evidence that some people will be involved in a conversation, they hear a piece of jargon, they don't know what it means, but perhaps feel a little bit embarrassed by saying, actually, I don't know what that means. They don't want to show that they don't understand. So they just nod sagely and continue. And they make an assumption as to what that word or what that abbreviation actually means. And sometimes incorrectly. And then, of course, they go on to have conversations with other people and they use that term incorrectly, as we would know it, which causes the next person to question what's going on. So having to break down uh, the use of jargon is hugely prevalent in the financial services world. But also, it's not just there. It's also in the world at large. I'm sure people have seen the meme that said the person that, who sent out the text message, so sorry to hear your husband died, lol. This was somebody who found out later that LOL doesn't mean lots of love. Uh, it actually means laughing out loud. So the use of the abbreviation was completely well-intentioned, but entirely inappropriate if you perceive it to mean laughing out loud. So we will try to avoid where we can um, the use of jargon. We don't want to confuse the situation, but if we do slip into it, please forgive us. It's, it's our everyday speak. Um, and feel free to stop us and say, I, I don't get what that means, please explain a little bit further. I'm happy to do so. So immediately in the session like this, we've run into um, some words already. So you've got regtech and fintech. What do they mean? And I, even now you begin to hear people saying slightly different um, interpretation of what they actually mean. So I thought it might help us um, to look at some definitions as uh, I've researched them, just to explain what we mean by RegTech and FinTech. So RegTech is defined as, as you can see, the management of regulatory processes within the financial industry through technology, use of technology. The main functions including regulatory monitoring, reporting, and ensuring compliance. They're not my definitions, these are research definitions. FinTech is the integration of technology into offerings by financial services providers in order to improve their use and their delivery um, to their consumers. Question was asked a little while ago. It says, so these are relatively new, RegTech and FinTech. Um, and I would have to say, are they? Having been around myself in the financial services industry for getting on to 30 years, uh, I would argue that they are not new. Um, and in fact, there are some research has been uh, undertaken that suggests that they've been around, particularly um, FinTech, for a lot longer than most people would think. In fact, there was a, uh, a learned professor, Professor Douglas Arner, who actually broke FinTech into three, FinTech development into three key periods believe it or not. FinTech 1.0, 1866 through to 1967. The, the, those who are good at history trivia uh, may remember that 1866, the reason it was such a, a, an important year, it was the year that the first transatlantic cable was installed, allowing communication across the Atlantic 
1967 to the year 2008. Um, why 2008? Um, the global financial crisis hit and that caused a sea change in the whole idea of reg tech and fintech. So Professor Arnold would have you believe it's been around for an awful lot longer. Um, but then you look at our lifetimes and certainly as I say, if you've been around as long as me, in my working life, I, when I first started work, I know it was a long time ago, but when I first started work, if I wanted to get some cash from my bank, I had to go down to the bank with my checkbook, write out a check for cash, give it to the teller over the other side who then gave me my cash. That was pretty much the only way to do it. And then along came ATMs, automated telling machines. Surely that's a, a, a development, a, uh, a, a significant development that sort of changed the way in which we bank. Now the banks are open 24 hours a day. That of itself was, it was a big issue. However, the pace of technology is increasing all the time. The pace of advancements, technology advancements is continually uh, improving. There was something, it's known as Moore, Mr. Moore's Law. Moore's Law talks about the processing power of computers and suggests that computer processing power doubles every two years. Two becomes four, four becomes eight, eight becomes 16, and so on. I should throw in that anybody who's following what's going on in the world of quantum computing will realize that quantum computing, when it's finally nailed out, will be a massive, massive change um, in the way uh, in which we use computing power. To put it in perspective, um, a modern PC would need around about a billion different processors, because in quantum computing, a single register can perform a billion computations. It's that order of magnitude, it, it is a game changer. But coming back to, to, to where we are now, even in the, the period that I'm talking about, the rate of change in the advancement of technology has, it's been quite staggering. And to try and again, put it into perspective to get us to recognize, in 1969, the Apollo 11 went to the moon. Its entire guidance system had two kilobytes, not megabytes, two kilobytes of RAM. That's less than a modern poster. But even that of itself isn't the significant fact. The modern computer processes data around about, because of mortal doubling, around about 100,000 times quicker than it did back in that time. So to put that into perspective, modern home computer, what takes, nowadays it takes one second, done. In 1969, would have taken over a day. In fact, 27 hours and 47 minutes to do the processing that we now do in one second. That's the order of magnitude. That brings with it a rapid and increasingly rapid change in the whole reg tech fintech environment. One of the issues that we struggle with um, constantly is over publishing. Um, people saying, certainly in the early days, that reg tech and fintech were the solution to all the industry's problems. We'll, we'll solve all the problems that you've got through big tech and fintech. And the, the wiser ones amongst us realize that whilst they do bring huge advantages, massive advantages, and we will talk about some of those with our panelists a little bit later and where that's taking us, we must always keep an eye on the fact that they increase some of our existing risks and actually introduce entire new areas of risk that we have to be mindful of, may not even have thought about yet, before we go down this road and introduce and implement things that subsequently come back um, to, to haunt us. People talk about oh, things like, okay, well, we'll go into this whole idea of uh, bio access. So maybe it'd be your fingerprints or your retina scans or whatever it may be. Uh, maybe that's going to be uh, uh, an increasing way forward. And we've certainly seen it even in 
mobile phones now with your retinal scan or your finger um, at the back giving you, I can open my bank accounts just with uh, my finger. It's all great and wonderful. Um, but there are certain parts of the world where, okay, I steal your phone, but your phone's no good because I need the part of you that unlocks it. So I'll just cut your fingers off then or take your eyeballs. This idea of kidnap and maiming to get bioaccess is a byproduct of those technology advancements. We need to think about that. And if we want an example of how this thing can run away with itself, let's look at one from our industry, um, Commonwealth Bank of Australia. I'm not giving away any secrets here, by the way, this is all public information. Commonwealth Bank of Australia had a great idea to take the ATM, the automated telling machine, and develop it even further to produce the intelligent telling machine. However, the new machines, great as they were, and they had all sorts of additional features, great as they were, they failed to aggregate the deposits that were being made by people, which is a regulatory requirement. It's to stop people depositing small amounts frequently to hide the fact that they're actually depositing a huge amount of money. And it is a requirement uh, in many countries, and certainly in Australia, that ag uh, deposits from individuals are aggregated. Well, the machines didn't do this. That led to the uh, regulator alleging 390,000 breaches of regulations by one bank. Um, by the way, each, each of those breaches technically could raise a fine of up to 1 million Australian dollars. So you work, do the maths, that's $390 billion that uh, Commonwealth Bank of Australia were facing as a fine. That's probably likely to have crippled um, one of the big four banks uh, in Australia and actually is ridiculous to even consider finding a company like that if you still need it around. Think of the jobs that uh, depend on it and all the other spin out from it. So what they actually did is they agreed that they would uh, they plead guilty to failing to report 53,000 suspicious transactions instead. But they still paid the country's biggest fine at that time of 700 million Australian dollars. To put it into context, in Australia, the previous largest fine for money laundering was paid by a company called Tabcor, which is a betting company. It was 45 million. So we went from 45 million to 700 million in one step. And actually the 700 million by many was, was deemed to be a bit of a let off given that it could have been $390 billion. So this leads us into this whole area of artificial intelligence. It is a fascinating subject and one that's misquoted and misunderstood a lot. Um, again, as part of the research for this session, I was looking up um, a few bits and pieces and I obviously wanted to talk about Alan Turing. Um, Alan Turing, often dubbed the father of modern computing, was actually based at the University of Manchester. I've seen his pictures on the wall, it's great. Um, after his work with the British Intelligence Service at Bletchley Park finished. And he is credited with a lot of the original thinking about the genesis of artificial intelligence. However, according to IBM, you should know about these things, IBM say that when people talk about AI, they're not talking about artificial intelligence. What they're referring to is augmented intelligence, and there is a difference. So to, to understand the difference again, going back to my bank teller example, if you employ a human being in a bank and their job is to sit there and hand out cash and take in cash all day long, and they have a drawer of money to do that from. If they notice partway through the day that drawer is getting extremely empty because there's been a lot more withdrawals than they expected, one would hope that they would call somebody and say, hey, I'm running out of money, you need to come and fill up the drawer. That's because they are intelligent. However, if you put that money into an ATM, it will keep dispensing cash until it runs out and then it will stop working. Unless somebody programs it to make a report at the point that it's running low in cash. 
So augmented intelligence is about doing things quicker and faster, without illness and without errors. But there's a big difference between augmented intelligence and artificial intelligence. That would suggest to me then that the failure of CBA had absolutely nothing to do with the failure of artificial intelligence. The machines did exactly what they were programmed to do. They didn't make the mistakes. It was human error, human oversight, or maybe worse, who knows, that actually failed, that let the bank down. So turning back to, returning to sort of uh, regtech and fintech, those who are in the industry will, will recognize there was a time a few years back where nobody had ever heard of regtech and fintech or barely heard of them. And then suddenly they became these massively hot topics. Um, and it wasn't help, but it seemed to me as a potential consumer of these things, as a compliance officer, that we were suddenly deluged by experts, people who just suddenly overnight had become experts in reg tech and fintech. And some of the promises, I know Chuck Hitman was talking about this a while ago, that were being made in the very early days as to the issues that they could identify and resolve and actually will solve all of your compliance problems and maybe cure world hunger while we're doing it. It was, it was quite outrageous at the time. As one would expect, and many of those so-called experts aren't around anymore. They couldn't survive in this world. But there are, fortunately, uh, a whole bunch that did know what they were doing, um, did understand the then and current limitations, but were smart enough to be able to look forward to the, to the benefits, to work towards the advantages that can give us. Um, they adapted, they prospered, and they, excelled in this industry and we're very fortunate to have Dr. Lim here tonight, Dr. Lim, whose firm specializes in providing reg tech and fintech advice to startups, companies beginning to enter into the uh, arena. Um, actually, Dr. Lim's written an article that she's going to share with you all after this session is over and I'll come back to that in a little while. And of course, again, Chai Kit was one of those early um, adopters and has been extremely successful. His company is extremely well regarded by many uh, the experts including regulators and his colleagues um, and evidently has quite a passion for this is always in touch with the latest sentiment the developments and that's quite a key thing looking at where uh, Ray Tech and Fintech are going in the future man he'll be he'll share with us a little while in a little while some of those insights just on the whole subject of hype um, sorry I, this is like hype Hype is, is, is talked about, uh, actually the Gartner Research Company produced the hype cycle where they talk about hype. And it says in a world like uh, the one that we have now, we have a trigger, a technology trigger, and that immediately generates these huge expectations, inflated expectations to all the things that it's going to do for you. And then as we begin to understand uh, what's realistic, what is actually achievable, we, it leads to the so-called trough of disillusionment before we start to climb the slope of enlightenment to what we can actually expect of it. Um, and we get to the so-called plateau of our productivity. It is said that FinTech is currently in the trough of disillusionment. I personally don't think that's the case. I think we've been through the trough of disillusionment. I think we're back up. Uh, on the other side, we we understand the limitations, but also the uh, amazing opportunities that we can work towards. So I do think that we are heading up the slope of enlightenment and long may we continue to do so. Almost when you reach the plateau of productivity, there's nothing new left to do. So I think that that slope of enlightenment will keep us all gainfully uh, occupied for many years to come. And I'm not also convinced that there was such a massive uh, swing uh, in that most practitioners certainly were fairly sanguine about some of the claims that were being made, the more outlandish claims um, at that time. But there is no doubt that the actual benefits are better understood um, as time goes by, what we can and cannot do. I was also asked to just briefly touch upon cryptocurrency um, as we had some suggestions that that might be of interest to our audience. And again, the panel are happy to take questions on uh, cryptocurrency. 
in my opinion, that is only my opinion, in my opinion, the underlying blockchain and distributed ledger technology is a massive bonus to come out of that the advent of cryptocurrency. But it also brings with it a whole host of money laundering and terrorist financing and other risks that we're, again, purely in my opinion, still not addressing properly. Um, along, of course, with the actual investment risk itself um, and the options for hacking and internal mistakes. The Satis Group recently um, stated that they believe that 80% of the world's initial coin offerings were scams from the outset. They set out to be fraudulent. So much so that countries like China has banned all initial coin offerings, they just will not have them at all. In between 2011 and 2021, 63 cryptocurrency exchanges were hacked or reported, maybe more, those are the ones that were reported. Um, and this year alone, as you can see, Cryptopia in February, 15.5 million US, EasyFi in April, 80 million, uh, Liquid, um, in August, 74 million, and the P network in September, 12.67 million. And you've got to remember, these are people who you would expect to know what they're talking about. So the exchanges themselves um, have suffered somewhat. I suppose you shouldn't say on the plus side, but looking at it from a consumer, sometimes actually, instead of losing in the usual way, so that we all lose every penny that we put in, a number of people have made some significant profits out of the mistakes made by the providers. In February of this year, Citibank lost a court battle. They were trying to force uh, the people who'd received over 900 million US dollars sent to hedge funds in error. And the court said, it's your fault. No, nope. we're not going to order these people to return the money to you. $100 million. In June of this year, BlockFi accidentally sent out 10 million US dollars in bonuses. Keeps going. In July, Alchemix accidentally, prematurely forgave just under $5 million worth of outstanding loans. Said, yep, they're all good, they're redeemed. But this month, Compound sent up to $89 million worth of crypto tokens in error. They were supposed to be for future investors, but they sent them out now. And using a mixture of threats, we will out you, we will report you to the, I, I, the uh, authorities, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, offers to meet with the founder to have one-on-one -on -one meetings and then resulting in general pleading they asked the people who'd received $89 million, please give it back. And that last publication, about 36 million actually had been given back. But that's still over $60 million just lost through mistakes. Um, and again, I keep coming back to the fact that these are companies that one would expect to be at the cutting edge of technology, understanding what it is they're doing, and yet they're losing all this money. The only issue I'll, I'll park for now, but leave you thinking about is so, okay, Compound mistakenly sent up to $89 million worth of tokens. And they say that these tokens were for future investors. Where did that money come from? Where did the $89 million actually come from? Who created it? Was it sitting on deposit somewhere? Or was it just something that somebody made up? Interesting thought. So the whole idea of the, these companies getting it wrong segues nicely into another subject that we're, we want to talk about, which is cybersecurity. As our reliance on technology increases, so do our cybersecurity risks. There's no doubt they go hand in hand. Um, and that's why I'm delighted that we have Daryl here um, heading up KPMG cybersecurity consulting practice to give us some um, insight into cybersecurity. To round it off, some of the comments that I'm making might make you think I'm some 19th century Luddite trying to stop the advancement of technology. And I tell you now that could not be further from the truth. Um, I absolutely welcome any and all advancements that help us 
as I, I wrote my, my notes, to rid the world of the horrors that are associated with money laundering, financing of terrorism, financial crime generally. It's only when you work in that environment and you realize it's not just white collar crime, a few people evading tax. There are lives lost, lives lived in misery. It is tragedy heaped upon tragedy. So I absolutely welcome any changes that we can make to, to staunch that flow. The only point I'm, I reiterate is that we must continue to ensure that as we move forward, we don't replace the current threats that we are at least to a degree dealing with, with new threats that we haven't thought about and we're not dealing with, that opens up this entire new avenue for the terrorists, the uh, criminal gangs, the money launderers to exploit. So, not a Luddite. That's it for me. I, I think, um, hopefully that's given kind of people a, a catch up to where we are now. We'll look to turn forward to what can Red Tech and FinTech do for us. Um, and that means it's time to talk to uh, our panel. I'm going to start off by uh, asking a question, but we have a Q&A um, uh, box open for you, uh, for the audience. Please post your questions um, in there. I will do my best to then uh, pass them out to the panelists uh, and get some answers for you. One of the problems with this, in this environment I found in years is you've very often you tend to get what you're given. Whether it's what you wanted or not, you're going to get what you're given. But the, uh, the, the advantage of the Q&A sessions is that hopefully we can shape it to get to what, it, what it is it that's actually concerning you, what it is that you want to know about. And the beauty of doing it this way is you don't have to be in a hall full of a thousand people and put your hand up and wait for somebody to bring your microphone and then stand up um, and ask what you think might actually not be a very sensible question. So you just don't do it. It's anonymous. So it should allow people to uh, hopefully ask some questions. So I'm going to turn now to the panel. Thank you very much for listening to me. I'm going to turn to the panel and I'd like to start with a highly topical subject, of course, COVID-19. The impact of COVID-19 in the reg tech and fintech space. I, I know because I've been working in Singapore for years that the, the Monetary Authority of Singapore has produced dozens of paper on the subject of COVID-19, including some aimed squarely at the reg tech and fintech um, users and the providers. And that made me think, well, Dr. Lim, as you've been so helpful in helping firms start up and also assessing the impact of COVID-19, perhaps you could start us off by telling us about the, your perspective on the impact of COVID-19 in terms of reg tech and fintech. And I'll stop sharing my screen so we can actually see your face. Uh, thanks a lot for Andrew for the question. Uh, actually, uh, what uh, I am feeling is that um, when you talking about the impact of Red Tech and uh, a lot of things from the market perspective, it depends on the demand. If the demand side um, increase, that means that a lot of corresponding technology will increase the demand also, and with a lot of great opportunities. So uh, when uh, during the COVID time, a lot of people uh, need to work at home. And uh, so when you need to work at home, then you need to have a lot of technology set up to support you uh, for the compliance and work at home. And then uh, more strict red tech things need to deploy at the same time, especially about the cybersecurity and uh, people need to, uh, 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 especially the financial institutions, they need to work on the new policy and new guideline and new compliance rule in order to work at home. So, and also the social distance uh, consideration also. So I think that um, the COVID-19 uh, uh, actually bring more opportunities for the deployment of um, red tech at the same time. Uh, and also because of the cross-border restrictions. So a lot of things uh, you need to do that um, instead of face-to-face -face, like now, we need to do that by Zoom. Uh, a lot of KYC thing, you cannot see people face-to-face. Um, -face. You need to accept uh, something to be done online. So uh, you need to 
rely on some uh, biometric or AI technology to do KYC, and you cannot check the people's identity uh, 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 face to face. So I think that because of the COVID, uh, it actually improved the, the speed of the development of Red Hat and bring a lot of new opportunities uh, in that area. A lot of um, uh, compliance need to um, define uh, uh, in, in form of digital rules and um, uh, the demand is huge. And uh, so, so that's my view and see if other panel member has other view also. That's that's really interesting. And I think I'm, I'm going to cut to check it now because certainly from my experience, COVID accelerated things that we were probably going to do, always wanted to do, but didn't really have the budget or the time or whatever to do it. And then COVID hit and we had no choice but to, to make those developments, make those investments. So it's affecting startups, uh, obviously, but it's affecting the existing industry. Chaiki, do you want to jump in there? Yeah, uh, sure. Thanks. Um, I, I kind of agree with, um, you know, the high level summary that Amanda, um, um, Dr. Lim have, have sort of uh, given earlier on, but I'll sort of add to this, right? Because I mean, using my own personal experience, but I, I used to work as a compliance officer, head of compliance with banks as well. So we've always typically been struggling between implementing, you know, uh, new systems and changing old systems. And, you know, the refresh of systems um, is, is ongoing. It's, it's a day job, you know, for a lot of people. Um, but, and, and so we, we, I mean, within Synopsys itself, we've got this um, uh, tagline, which you call um, digitize the... Um, analog and automate the manual yeah so that's been something that we've been trying you know automate the manual or digitize the analog and that's been the tagline that we've been trying to push um, even way before covid you know and and you hit it at uh, the the at the head um, in terms of um, the speed and the pickup and the trigger point for people to then adopt this pretty sensible thing you know you you gotta you, you can't keep doing things in a manual fashion you know, means that you can't keep throwing bodies at the problem. You know, you can only expand your compliance department up to this certain number of um, people, yeah. you know, after which your CEO is going to come down and say, hey, I think you need to cut back on your, you know, on your headcount. So that certainly have, have um, uh, you know, been, been a big trigger point uh, for the points that Amanda have mentioned, that which I won't repeat. And I think um, looking back in 2020 itself, where, you know, when COVID hit um, uh, everywhere else, and I, th I think from a regulator's perspective, look, talking about uh, Monetary Authority of Singapore, um, I think it had done a, a great job um, uh, in actually pushing it, it's in the incumbent uh, traditional players or anybody within the financial sector to actually embrace technology. So that's actually helpful. I mean, I won't talk a bit too much, but, you know, the grants and all that kind of stuff uh, that they have issued uh, last year and this year would have helped to speed up the, um, the level of adoption of solutions that is out there in the market. Chaiki, you and I were at a session a while ago, which is a very nice segue into the subject. And I'm, I, something I think we should raise and talk about. There's a lot of concern that reg tech and fintech is going to put people out of work and it's going to decimate the workforce and we'll all have to go hunting for jobs as um, you know, do, doing other things. And we talked about this at a session and concluded that's far from the truth. Would you want to just expand on that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. I mean, for, for the audience who may not know what compliance um, uh, people are doing, you know, because uh, FinTech, you know, as, as Andrew has defined earlier on is, uh, I mean, I have my own definition, basically, you know, quite simply put, right, to provide financial services using technology or using new technologies, for example. And then RegTech really means that, you know, using technology to um, achieve better regulatory outcome. So compliance officers sits in the middle whereby they are helping organizations to better comply and you know, to make sure that the organization does not run foul of, of the rules and the regulations that uh, they are obliged to comply with. So therein where lies um, what kind of jobs uh, or tasks compliance officers are being assigned to. Now for the very mundane, routine, repetitive, you know, uh, low level, low skilled work, it is definitely going to be replaced and it is already being replaced you know, by the likes of transaction monitoring, sanction screening, and some of these, you know, um, uh, repetitive work, I would say. And if you apply a, a layer of artificial intelligence into the uh, reducing of the false positive, then, you know, another layer of quote-unquote fats 
uh, of so-called manual laborious work is, is taken out, means that the human body gets taken out. But um, what then comes back on, it will be the jobs in, in, uh, in respect of analyzing the results, analyzing the, uh, the outcomes, as well as providing advisory to regulatory interpretation. And that's not something at the moment uh, is replaceable by uh, technology as I see it. Even though some of you may have heard of this term called, you know, codified regulations and the regulators trying to use codes um, to write their regulation and, you know, non-tech people like ourselves is going to wonder, so what does that actually mean? You know, it, it does not, it, it's actually very um, advanced in terms of um, very new, um, I would say cutting edge, if you like, but it's not something that is going to be in the mainstream as yet. Interesting. Um, it is a fascinating subject. We can talk about it for hours, but we, we need to move on. We've uh, had a couple of questions in from our audience, which is great. Thank you very much um, for sharing. The first one was uh, very interesting. Regulatory compliance is often seen as a cost center for financial institutions. And I can tell you, certainly in the early days, it absolutely was. Although now the the penalties associated with non-compliance are running into the billions, not millions of dollars. So it kind of uh, balances it a little bit. But uh, so the question is, do you believe that reg tech adoption tends to be regulator led rather than being done voluntarily by financial institutions? I'll throw that open to the panel. Who wants to come in? I can. <laughs> please, please. Um, uh, 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 partly uh, um, uh, following on from what I what I just mentioned, because if um, we we see uh, at least within the RegTech ecosystem, we see uh, the adoption of RegTech as something that is uh, at the moment not really optional, because you know with the new norm uh, brought about by COVID. You know, you do have to have um, interaction with clients and it's largely driven by consumer and your customer's demand, right? If people do not want to, you know, acquire a financial service through a face-to-face -face interaction, then you have to move. And if you have to move, then you have to put in place, you know, preventive detective controls, you know, in the light of reg tech uh, to manage those risks. And so, you know, if it's regulator-led, um, uh, yes, uh, but it cannot be solely regulators led you know it has to be done with a view that ultimately you want to you are the one who's being who are required to comply and therefore you know the regulatory obligation is on you now if you think of adopting a technology to comply better and then you have a better regulatory outcome then i would suggest that you actually then end up with what you call regulatory advantage over your competitors so why wouldn't you want to do it voluntarily? Then that's where you can convert a cost center mentality into a revenue center and a regulatory advantage. It's interesting. One of my course directors did his thesis on his master's and the subject was um, compliance um, as a business generator and enabler, which is quite an interesting one. Daryl, I wonder if I can bring you in here um, on the whole subject of cybersecurity because this kind of applies as well where people are advancing their uh, use and reliance on technology, but do you find that they are reticent to invest the money in the security side of it, or is it things are they welcoming it with open arms and saying yes, we need more of that? Yes, uh, thanks, Andrew. The you know the topic of cybersecurity and reg tech typically are not common bedfellows, right? No. Because on one hand, you have a regulatory compliance mindset where uh, reg tech is is to help you comply with regulations and can be anything. Uh, in terms of how, how financial institutions regula are regulated. But security, on the other hand, has traditionally been a risk topic. So uh, when you say risk, a board of directors will say, look, you know, here's some sets of risk we're worried about. Uh, it could be cryptocurrency attacks. It could be uh, you know, your traditional uh, malware, or it could be something like uh, ransomware, which is quite hot these days. So the problem comes up when you say investment uh, in a compliance function, versus investment in a risk function, where do you put your dollars? The correct answer, of course, is both. <laughs> you have to do compliance-based investment in order to make sure you keep your banking license. But having done the compliance part, you then need to look beyond the regulations because regulations can only see what's known. And where risk comes in is to examine the dark corners of the room where less is known. Uh, you know, these black swan events that you have to anticipate could occur. 
and that's where cybersecurity is different than, than, than reg compliance. It is trying to look at uh, an evolving threat. It's something that is hard to regulate for, but something you must do. Uh, unless you want to also have a situation where you totally in compliance with you are in compliance with regulations, but yet you have left certain you know back doors open in your systems which can be exploited, and then you get a cyber attack. And this is traditionally the conundrum that most companies come up with: Do I spend on one or the other? The answer is you've got to do both. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting, and that's there's been a, a fantastic follow-up question from from one of our audience, um, which is dealing with the whole security issue, which is: Is it safe to assume that reg tech ultimately will be cloud-based and if it is how comfortable are we that that is safe from intrusion given that we're dealing with incredibly sensitive client and personal uh, information what are your thoughts there's no wrong answer i'm just interested in your thoughts and that that's to me andrew is it well let's start with you please if we can Daryl. sure sure Look, uh, you know, any kind of fintech, regtech, any kind of tech typically does start off with a cloud-based platform uh, in its design. In, in the past, maybe four or five years ago, we would consider cloud, especially, uh, you know, public cloud as being quite unsafe. Most regulators would not allow any kind of financial institution uh, the opportunity to try and load balance uh, or scale up their IT infrastructure by using elements of cloud. This has changed. In the last two to three years, we've seen regulators start to shift their mindset. And what's changed here is the big cloud vendors. Now I'm talking about the big three. You know, you've got your, your uh, Amazons and AWS, right? You've got your Google Cloud, uh, and you've got your uh, Microsoft as your. Microsoft, yeah. It's actually increased the level of security that you can actually get uh, by using their platforms than if you were to try and do it in-house in your own company. So we've come up, uh, you know, in a very strange way uh, to the situation where it's safer to put your data in the cloud today uh, than it is possibly to put it in your own company. Now, this is not always true. It depends on the type of uh, investment dollars you spent to date. And banks have been doing this for a long time. But if you're a small startup, a fintech, or you know a ragtag type company, placing your ragtag solution on the cloud is probably the best thing you could do if you're buying the services of one of the three major vendors or similar because they've built in very good cybersecurity controls around these things. And one of the biggest, and so one of the big risks that clients have around uh, you know, security in the cloud is access to data. And so identity access management systems uh, are things that we find hard to manage in-house. By this, I mean, your usual user ID and log on password, you know, uh, the majority of users will write down their passwords because if you try and keep a 16, a digit password or even an eight digit password and it's changed every month eventually what you do is you, you you take your favorite word and you put in some numbers at the end start with one and next month it's two and three and you you, you do this i mean anyone can relate to this these are hackable because you know dictionary attacks are very easy to, to unmask these things i'm guilty of doing this as well in the past um better is to have stronger passwords but here's the problem um, you know, good security relies strongly on the ability of the user to have a unique identity. How do we do that? Biometrics, but these have been defeated as well. So in the age of ragtag, we now have to go to AI. And AI assumes that you are not who you are, you say you are. Your password's been compromised, you've logged on. And what they're trying to do here is look at your behavior as a user. Are you logging on at a very strange time from a strange location with an unknown mobile device because they can track your IP? And these kinds of behavioral analytics is now what banks are using as part of RegTech uh, to identify if the user is a scammer, uh, a crook, or you. It is interesting what you say, because I travel a lot, certainly pre-COVID, and I get very frustrated with constant uh, checks and interruptions because I am using a new device, I am in a new country, I have a different IP address, but I understand why. What we've actually talked about here, you mentioned um, startups. It's a great opportunity for Ken to bring Dr. Lim back into the conversation about using startups and the advice you'd give them in terms of using the cloud or, or what, how, how, would you, how do you see it? Uh, the only solution is using cloud. There's no way to build your own infrastructure. No one do so because uh, startup, the cost is the, uh, the critical successful factor because you know that the, the P you come from the profit margin. So um, the, the difference uh, the, between the 
if you build in-house, no one use in-house. So they always uh, use cow uh, to do so. And actually, uh, even for, for my projects, they even get the ISO uh, for the security standard. And uh, for ISO, you can use uh, SAAS for doing ISO also. You can get the security certificate also. So um, it's quite common nowadays. And there are tools to do the assessment of the, the security, where they can achieve the standard or not. So it's easier and more secure if you use cow. And then, I think it's oh, faster. Sorry. And also for the security, uh, data security, I, I think that uh, nowadays if people use blockchain and uh, together with cow and also um, uh, federated learning together. So uh, a lot of data security issue can be resolved if you you uh, cross cross uh, locations sharing of data and doing machine learning kind of things. Uh, actually, I want to share something something that uh, you asked beforehand. Sorry, uh, do you mind? So, uh, regarding the, uh, is it okay? I yes, something? absolutely. Okay, okay. Uh, you asked about, the. Um, can you see the screen? You asked about uh, why um, nowadays people need to implement uh, Red Hat. I think the most critical thing is related to the uh, keep increasing of the cost of compliance. And uh, the cost is huge for financial services. And um, that means that if they don't use Red Hat, uh, they will lose their competitiveness. And a lot of new startup coming, uh, even FinTech startup, and also new uh, financial institute coming if they are using technology. So if they don't use Red Hat to remain their competitiveness, they will suffer a lot. And, and um, from their PNL, that will be terrible. So I think that Red Hat can help them to reduce their internal compliance costs significantly. So that is a big demand of Red Hat. That, that's my thought. It's interesting because as a consumer and just a general user, like I said, I, I, I've got latest phones and I've built my own computers and I do a lot of stuff online. I, I have no fear of it. But I, even I found when I realized that my um, downloads for, for work, uh, PDFs and um, emails and stuff, I'd seen this little sign up on my uh, Explorer. I hadn't really bothered clicking on it uh, for ages until I was trying to tidy up a bit. And I suddenly clicked on it and realized how much of my work was being held in the cloud. Um, I haven't put it there, it's gone there automatically. And I have to be honest, my immediate reaction is like, I don't want it up in the cloud. I, I think there's still a big fear factor surrounding what goes on in the cloud for, unless you're one of those people who works with it and knows what's, uh, knows what's going on. There are a couple more questions I, I, I'd like to get to. And one of them, interestingly, is about outsourcing. I, I remember years ago, we used to say, if you want to get into regulatory trouble, just outsource compliance. That's a great way of inviting the regulator in and, and it's going to cause you problems. But one of the questions is that it seems that people are keen or adamant on outsourcing their compliance work. Um, is that something you've found or is it a trend or what? Um, well, if I, if I can have a go at this first, um, I think... It's not so much of a trend. It's a, it's a function of like, like what um, you know, uh, uh, Amanda alluded to earlier on around cost of compliance. People are constantly looking at ways to cut costs or reduce costs or to be more efficient, right? And number one, uh, that's number one. And number two, obviously, depending on the, uh, on the, uh, on the stage of growth or the size of that uh, FI, for example, um, they would not, if it's small, if it's a start, if it's a new uh, um, uh outfit you know they may not need a full-time compliance team and that's where they start to outsource and until they grow to a certain size and scale and then they say hey i, I you know i you, you i need to do this internally right so that that's always been a, an, an option um, but i think what is very clear you know wearing the the old <laughs> compliance hat on um you can outsource the task you know but you can never outsource the accountability right that always remains and I think there may be some uh, misunderstood um, 
you know, uh, people out there that may think that if I outsource it to the consultant, then the consultant is responsible for compliance. And that's hardly true. And even if you have compliance department within your organization, typically it is the senior management, it is the board of directors that got called up um, for, or the business heads, for example, that got called up for regulatory, you know, uh, breaches. You know, compliance gets dragged along, but, you know, <laughs> the people that get sent to jail and get penalized personally is typically, you know, the business people. Well, so I do remember one of the client. largest banks in Singapore, you'll remember this like it a few years ago, their entire I'm not, ATM. I'm not as low as you, Andrew. Okay, it was only a few years <laughs> ago. Don't be cheeky. Um, you will remember, because we talked about this, one of the largest banks, they lost their entire ATM network for a few hours, uh, right across the whole island, and it obviously affected a lot of people. And the response came, well, of course, we outsourced the provision of our, oh, whoa, do not go, and then, of course, they immediately read it back and said, yes, whilst we outsourced it, and it was a failing on behalf of the outsourced party, it is absolutely the responsibility, and I believe they were fined um, for, that, for those failings. So I get that compliance can be incredibly expensive for the small firms. Now, certain countries that I, I've dealt with, in certain countries, you are allowed to be a compliance officer, a registered compliance officer, but for a limited number of organizations. I think in the Middle East, you can be the recorded compliance officer, but only for a certain number of companies. In other parts of the world, it's just really not acceptable. The compliance officer works for you. But just like a nominee director has all of the director's responsibilities, an outsourced yep. compliance officer has to have the responsibility, but as you say, not the accountability. Um, there's another question which has come through, which is which is uh, interesting, and it's picking up on a point that actually, Chucky, you made earlier. You said that high volume, low level repetitive tasks, and this is KYC, sanction screening, are the most obvious target for uh, development, which is great. But the question we've been asked is a bit of future gazing for all of you. What do you think are the next compliance risk areas beyond those low levels that RegTech may start being involved um, in it. Yeah, I think there are a few ways to answer this question, right? Because as we alluded to earlier on, you know, AML, KYC, aspect uh, is one big area that, uh, which is the use case. And it's, you know, we don't need to prove the use case, the use case is already there, you know, and it's just continuously being improved upon with, you know, advancement of technology, that's number one. And there are obviously other uh, verticals within the reg tech ecosystem, you know, that even talks about, you know, um, regulatory reporting, improving, you know, how regulatory reporting uh, are, are being uh, performed, you know, uh, co um, uh, how do you uh, track regulatory changes, for example, you know, so using, you know, uh, uh, natural language processing and, and the likes uh, are able to help to marry, you know, changes of regulations and rules then mirror that into your policies and then, you know, driven out um, with, with task and assignment to people. So that is obviously one area. But the second part of this question, uh, compliance risk, actually goes back down to what are compliance function, right? I mean, Andrew, you talked about compliance roles. You know, I would sort of sum it up in, in the, your, your you, you have used this acronym uh, to a few times, ATM, right? Um, so, in our um, uh, traditional compliance uh, uh, roles, uh, we typically call them, you know, I, I call them ATM as well, advisory training and monitoring. That's what compliance officer does day in, day out. But in this new world, ATM takes a different meaning. Analytics, technology, and even machine learning. You know, so which means that you know the 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 strength at, of your ability to guard against uh, regulatory breaches is is only as strong as their weakest link. If your compliance function and the mentality of the people, you know, is still very um, old school, very archaic, and not embracing technology and not wanting to know, you know, like for example, cloud and you know the risk element involved in it, then clearly that's where you will fall down because you you, you might be blindsided by the fact that someone else is going to take care of uh, cybersecurity, for example, and you know, uh, you, you don't really care, then that wouldn't be, be, be a good outcome. Okay, we've, we've got some really good questions coming through, and I, God, I wish we had hours to talk about this, um, but we don't. But one I would like to, to, to raise was, somebody's made a very good point here, that the heavily regulated sectors, um, <coughs> banking, maybe insurance, those kind of, those large 
organizations tend to adopt the business model of, okay, we see this incoming reg tech, fintech, we'll take it and we'll design it and develop it ourselves. So the days of, of banks just being banks are long gone. Now banks are trainers and they're educated. They do all sorts of things because they want to bring it in house. Um, the question we're being asked here is, do we think that reg tech companies will get a chance to compete with the banks themselves? Or even further, will the regulators, and you'll know this from your work with them, will the regulators say what can or cannot or even should be outsourced going forward? What do you think? Sorry. Actually, let's, let's bring Amanda in on that one if we can, because there's a lot of that's to do with reg tech uh, with startups. Do you think that's going to happen or do you think it's business as usual, the large boys are just going to do it themselves? Um, uh, to tell you the truth, it depending on uh, which region. Uh, I will say that if a US firm and uh, European firm, uh, they are in a better position and more advantage because the market size is much bigger, bigger and uh, the digital rules are more clear and the compliance cost is huge. So actually, I check a lot of uh, investment and a lot of startup to, to work on uh, those um, uh, red tech related uh, R&D. And also the, the government is really supportive for, for their success. Uh, in this region, uh, I think Singapore is better than Hong Kong much, much more. So maybe Hong Kong, I think that uh, they will still embrace uh, startup technology, but not likely to use a uh, local technology because it, it depends on uh, who set the rules. <laughs> it is and interesting. Who, who is the boss? I, right. <laughs> I know that I know that in Singapore that there are a lot of the sandboxes um, and a lot of development. And I've always looked at compliance over you know, the last 30 odd years is you've got these companies and we're all trying to do the same thing. Ultimately, we're trying to achieve the same goals. And we all develop our own internal and very expensive uh, ways of doing things, and they're not quite the same. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have a central version? But that then brings down the whole client uh, data protection. Da, da, da. So I know, just to one of our uh, questions here, that the idea of blockchain and distributed ledger technology potentially creating a central function forum for all of the other people to come into, and that forum being driven by reg tech and fintech companies rather than by the banks and insurers themselves. It's a big topic for discussion. There's a lot of work going on behind the scenes, certainly I'm aware of in the UK and also in Singapore. Um, sorry, let's have a look. Yes, we've got more questions coming through. Um, do we believe that distributed ledger technology, just mentioned about it, and blockchain, uh, will make compliance monitoring redundant? It's a big question. Um, well, not really, because at, at the moment, I mean, it, it's probably not, uh, maybe, I'm not sure whether it's within my lifetime that compliance monitoring becomes redundant, maybe after my lifetime, um, because um, not everything is on the blockchain at the moment. Um, and by the time whereby the whole, even if you are talking about, um, uh, even you know things like uh, CBDC, uh, avoid using acronym. Sorry, uh, central bank uh, digital currency, and every uh, country is starting to have their own versions of that, and that would sort of uh, give us the uh, the illusion that everything is in the public domain, and the reality is far from the truth, right? Because it it just gives um, perhaps the central banks uh, better control over what happened, but that doesn't mean that they're gonna share it with everybody. So I think that does not mean that uh, compliance monitoring will be redundant. In fact, it will be a little bit more, um, uh, a little bit trickier because um, of the fact that not everything is on the public domain. You know, even if you use Bitcoin and um, you know, some of the cryptocurrency as, as an example, you know, while the certain level of that um, is in the public domain that you can trace, you know, but whenever it hits a wallet or, or let's say for example, an exchange, you know, it straight away it goes into this pot, opaque pot that you can't really see what comes out on the other side. Do you know the one Bitcoin that goes into this exchange and half Bitcoin comes out from the other side may not be the same Bitcoin. Just like fifty dollar note you withdraw from the ATM machine is not the fifty dollar note that gets deposited uh, through the uh, wire transfer. 
Interesting. Okay. It's not entirely uh, traceable. I'd like to. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'd like to add to that. So, you know, there's, there's an idea here that because it's blockchain, it's highly secure. Uh, and, and, you know, you can trace it. And so, as, as uh, you know, Chaikit has just mentioned, it is a fallacy. So the, the, the blockchain itself, yes, inherently the concept is secure, um, but you're only as safe as your key. So, you know, the, um, the, the, top, the part, uh, Andrew, where you talked about cryptocurrency uh, mm -hmm. being hacked, they're, they're based on blockchain technology, but why are they being hacked? It's because uh, people have fallen prey to the usual uh, scam emails. You know, someone sent him a scam email, say, you know, use this wallet, etc. and they've lost control of their key. The guy has stolen the key, the key being your password equivalent, right? So the types of attacks that are, are used to uh, defeat the controls around blockchain are the same as any other type of system. Uh, you know, if you don't have your user ID and password safe, and in the case of blockchain, your, your key, um, yep. that can be compromised, you lose your access. Another thought, um, cyber criminals, when they ask for ransom through ransomware, do you notice that they always ask to be paid in Bitcoin or other types of mm -hmm. cryptocurrency? Mm -hmm. The reason for that is because of this, uh, you know, traceability issue that Chai Kit just mentioned. Uh, the fact that once it goes in a little black box and comes out the other side, you're basically washed the money. <laughs> you, 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 um, you don't get paid in hard cash anymore. You get paid in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency if you're a scammer. I love it where you see art imitating life, even on television, you see in the movies now, the modern uh, TV series, uh, a TV show called Billions, I watched that, where they're paying off somebody, um, and he goes, okay, here's your mill in crypto, and gives them a thumb drive. So it's exactly. also easier giving somebody a thumb drive than it is a million dollars in cash, which you then got to find out how to spend it. It is interesting, but I love your earlier point about the weakest link in the chain, and I'd love to do this if we were together in an auditorium, is let's ask people to be honest, how many of you have chosen a password and then just added the number one, two, three, and so on and so on, because you can't be bothered. How many of you use the same password on multiple sites? And I recently had a, a password, uh, an email come to me with the subject of uh, my password. And it actually is a password I have used, and I know which websites I use it on, both of whom were hacked about 18 months ago. But I can tell you, it's British Airways and LinkedIn, it was public news. And the, the force has written to me, you know this is genuine because this is your password, isn't it? Yes. And then they allege that I've been visiting inappropriate websites and they've turned on my camera and videoed me um, and they're going to post it on Facebook unless I pay them in crypto, uh, relatively small amount. So of course I pay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're right, it is down to people. And how many, how many people right now have got their passwords written down somewhere? How many times you walk in, I've done it walking to an organization, height, security, and then you look at people, you walk past and look at their laptop and they've sellotaped the password um, on the front of it. What's the point of having a password? Um, anyway, um, hugely interesting. Thank you for that. Uh, I don't know, what were we talking about? Oh, there's so many questions that we have here. Jackie, you, you briefly mentioned the verticals of RegTech. You wanna just yes. tell us what that, what that was, what you mean? Well, I, I said, uh, I, well, I gave some examples earlier on, right? Like uh, things like um, people who are doing uh, uh, regulatory change, tracking of regulatory change and, you know, regulatory reporting, um, even uh, chats surveillance, right? Something that is quite interesting as well. Um, and um, as well as um, uh, other forms of, you know, fraud monitoring and, and, and the likes. Okay, another question that we've had um, to back up what we've been saying, one of, one of the attendees has said, uh, having heard that MES have done uh, uh, some work, I gather that they're also collaborating with other regulators, including HKMA, um, including in places like Indonesia and Thailand. Um, this has got to be good uh, for the community, uh, I would have thought. Would you agree? Well, yes, I, I think... Um... If you follow the regulatory, um, um, I, I suppose, uh, thought leadership in, in the region or even globally, I mean, for what is worth, MAS is, is probably one of the uh, very advanced regulators that every regulators around the world is actually watching and, you know, trying to work together with. And um, one of the key things that they, and I'm not sure whether this is made public in terms of, you know, what they're working with other regulators. They always work with other uh, regulators for, uh, you know, MOUs and, and stuff like that. 
But I think um, bringing it back to what they are actually working in the in the sector itself, they've announced that you know they want um, uh, some banks, you know, to they're, they're building this platform, you know, where you know banks in in Singapore can actually share uh, information around you know uh, potential suspicious activities and and all that, so that as a whole it can actually be um, uh, you have a better view about. Uh, whether any financial crime is happening in Singapore. So I'm quite sure they are doing that with the rest of the mm. uh, other regulators in the region to have better collaboration. Yeah, we've had sort of examples before. I know certainly in the United Kingdom, there was a, a, a huge upsurge in motor fraud, motor claims, you know, fake accident and the like. And eventually they decided to get together through their uh, association and to start sharing information. Jai Kits had eight accidents this year, don't insure him um, kind of thing which because the criminals can do that without fear of data protection and all that, but we're sort of sometimes hamstrung a little bit by what we can and cannot do for very, very good reasons. So this idea of sharing, I would also put in the, out there, by the way, we're not having a massive, yay, um, MAS are the best in the world. We, we know that they've had some sandboxes in years gone by that they've spent 18 months on and have actually gone nowhere um, in the end, partly waiting for technology to catch up. Um, so this is not a, a, a rah-rah for them. It's all, and the UK, I know, is doing a lot of work. They have the whole gymnet thing going on. Um, okay. Um, so hopefully that answers that um, question, which is fine. I think, to be honest, we are pretty much up at about um, finishing time. Do you, do you want me to call, call it now, or do you want to have another five minutes, um, Phoenix, I'm asking you? Another five minutes, okay. Andrew. Brilliant. Okay, I was going to do it. Um, I have a, uh, one question here that's absolutely fundamental, um, and I'm glad that, that it was raised. And this, that's this. If you are deciding to adopt and enhance um, RegTech, and you're going to go outside of your organization and look at firms, look, what are the critical questions that you need to be asking those outsource that those those providers you know what can you do for me and i think that's one I, i'd like to start with amanda if i can bring amanda back um dr lynn to say what do you think are the questions people should be asking particularly of the young the startup companies yeah uh, actually i i will ask them if they have um iso uh, security certification <laughs> so uh, it, it's 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 a pretty easy one but i know from personal experience getting the isos is not easy you have to jump through an awful lot of hoops. So if you've got that external accreditation, that's a great start. Thank you. Anything else? Um, if I if I can jump in here very quickly, Andrew, um, I, I agree. And you know, we we have ISO twenty seven thousand one. I know you do. We have done it for two years now. So I think what, what I mean this is related to the earlier question that talked about securities and all that, because I think. And cloud, because I think, um, and it's again one of those uh, policy, you know, that if if we, um, and again, you know, I'm not not uh, contradicting what Daryl has said. If people have made the assumption that cloud is safer than, um, and you know, what was done previously, because we we quite frankly we cannot outbuild what the you know the big threes, for example, we cannot outbuild Amazon in terms of the infrastructure and everything else. But the key thing is that for a SaaS provider, you know, uh, which is that application, and if you deploy in the cloud, it does not mean that the cloud, which is AWS or Google, takes over all the responsibility on security. Because the application provider, which is a SaaS provider, the RegTech or the FinTech, themselves have to ensure that how they utilize the cloud mm -hmm. service providers, you know, uh, softwares and, and everything else uh, that, that, that works within, um, are well secured up. If they, for example, you know, in Singapore, uh, there's this requirement on no commingling of uh, customer data uh, under outsourcing guideline, right? Now, if they put all the customer's uh, record into one single instance, for example, and one single database, and then assessed by multiple clients, and maybe, you know, you can have logical access and all that, that potentially, you know, run the risk of, commingling of data together within the same database, one single database, and it has got that huge um, single point of failure, you know, if one thing is compromised. So I think what the question that needs to be asked really is whether, you know, how are they deploying your um, data into their solutions within the cloud? I think that will be very fundamental. 
think to keep to be honest, rather than rather than contradicting Darren, I think you're actually agreeing uh, with each other, and it brings us very nicely back to where we started, which is that if we accept that the cloud of itself is a safe environment, the weakness is the front end and the back end. It's the people putting the data into the cloud, the people pulling the data from the cloud, how they park it in there. So the actual mechanics of the cloud, I think we're saying if they're one of the big three, certainly are, are, are quite safe. But that's just what I was saying right at the beginning about we come up with these great ideas and oh yeah, we just dump it in the cloud and we haven't given consideration to the points that you've just made. Without doing that, we're, we're created, we've created new risks um, for exactly. ourselves that we're not tackling, which is right back to the very start of this session, which is a wonderful way of bringing this whole thing to a conclusion. We, we have a few more questions and I'm really sorry that we couldn't get to them all. I, I'd love, well, we could talk about this, I know, uh, as a panel, as I said earlier, for hours and hours, but we don't have time and it's unfair on those that want to go. So with your permission, I would like to just say thank you so much to the university for inviting me uh, along. Particularly, thank you to the panelists who've made my job so easy. Um, it's wonderful to, to listen to you guys. Thank you very much for sharing with us. I would now like to hand back to the university just to bring this session to an end. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, Darius, Amanda, and Jackie for the wonderful presentations and discussions. We hope that today's session has shed new light into FinTech, RedTech, providing you some useful and tips and ideas on how you can disrupt the way you do compliance. RedTechs have brought about technologies, innovations to help improve efficiencies and transparencies in regulatory. While we enjoy the positive impacts it brings to businesses, we must be mindful and manage the risks and implications carefully. Whether it's fintech or regtech, the future and opportunity of tech disruptions and innovations are tremendous. There's no better time now than ever to capitalize the opportunity for both finance and non-finance professionals to take action and be part of this exciting journeys ahead. For those who wish to pursue your careers in this area, you might want to check out our program on MSC Financial Management. This program is a joint collaboration between Hong Kong and Singapore Centre, meaning they study alongside with classmates from the top two financials and technology hub, where you can expand your network and opportunity while studying. Our MC Financial Management Program provides you with a deep understanding, knowledge and skills for a successful career in finance. This is a well-balanced program which covers the fundamentals of finance, business and management strategies, unique stats, global financial markets and institutions, international financial management, venture capitals and private equities, business models and financial strategies, where you talk a lot more about fintech, right? tests, all the emerging technologies and how you transfer your business models and things, etc. So you of course, running out with quantitative analysis tools and techniques and a finance research project to give you a holistic understanding of the industry. We will also be invited to master classes, trending topics and speakers events such as this, and interesting uh, an industry networking opportunity for your personal and de professional development. For more information, please contact my colleague business from Hong Kong Centre or myself, Jocelyn, from the Singapore Centre. Before we end this session today, we appreciate if you can take two minutes of your time to do a quick online survey by scanning the QR codes to provide your feedback so that we can improve the next time, to do better the next time. Last but not least, we'd like to thank all of you here today for attending the Future of Black Tech session this evening. We hope that you have some takeaways from the insightful presentation and panel discussion, and we look forward to see you again next time. Please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions Thank you once again and good night.